Welcome, everyone, to another broadcast of Philosophic Perspectives on the Artist First Radio Network. All past shows are archived. You can pick them up at artistfirst.com. And now here's your host, Mr. Arthur D. Schwartz. Hi, welcome back, everybody. Um, we're having a, little, a few technical problems today, but hopefully you uh, have to resolve yourself. Um, tonight's broadcast is called Hypnosis and the Shaping of Reality, and it's a bookend because just on January 4th, uh, one month ago, I did a show uh, called uh, Consciousness and the Shaping of Reality. And so uh, l- let me just get into that subject because... When you say consciousness, certainly it embodies both consciousness, you know, and subconsciousness. Of course, subconsciousness is to some degree thought of as unconscious. Sometimes they call it the unconscious. The thing is, um, shaping reality through consciousness is something I've always been interested in. I'm getting more and more interested in it. Um, as I mentioned, um, I think in that show a month ago, I, I, I'm going to write a book that's... Um, Having it in pinch, what that is, yes, it's about that more or less philosophically. And um, the thing about that is consciousness and subconscious. So, conscious shaping of reality. This, there's a few things in terms of what it means directly, and also the kind of metaphysical or scientific underpinning um, of uh, what that means. So, I. Uh, Take, for example, the book, The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale, the classic written in the 50s. I think it was written in the 50s. And, you know, that's very much uh, the, the idea is of this, the power of positive thinking, the power of your conscious mind, although I think Peale did kind of delve into the subconscious, whether you remember a little bit. But we think of that as more, you know, positive thinking, a kind of conscious, you know, force. Yes, I can do it. Um, yes, do it, just do it, just do it. That kind of rigorousness. Whereas the subconscious is the opposite. The subconscious is you do it because that's what's impelling you from, from somewhere, from some root, from some source. It's driving you towards a, a certain goal or a certain kind of behavior. And so if you talk about shaping of reality, that's one thing. Now, the other thing is the subject that came up and in that show, and I, I heard this interview with this Dr. Kirby Surprise, a um, uh, book where he wrote Synchronicity, and I think he was talking about Joseph Ryan, the great parapsychologist, who had, had three, consistently had results of 3 to 6 percent mental focus having some kind of influence over um, uh, precognition, uh, experimentation, of, then later on. Uh, random number generators, and that's a, that's a different thing than the power of positive thinking, because there you're having some kind of an explanation of why this happens. Uh, in, in the interview I heard uh, Dr. Surprise, I mean, he, he talked about, in, from a quantum perspective, of uh, the focus is creating a, a certain 3 to 7% probability that's kind of an edge to influence reality. Well, it's not my place to go into that subject too much tonight, except for the fact that when we talk about the subconscious mind, I think we're talking about something that does basically shape reality and is the wild card, the thing that it's kind of... uh, you know, unlike positive thinking, the subconscious can give you a surprise. No pun intended to Dr. Kirby, surprise. Uh, because we're not aware of it. That's just the whole point. And here's the thing that I believe, and this is something I kind of, well, no, I'll I just uh, skip what I was just about to say there, but this is something um, that is extremely uh, important because any conscious choice that becomes shaping is so influential in one way or the other that it changes the world, whether it's in your own personal world or in a collective sense of sociologically, uh, worldwide, and so forth. Um, basically, those 
conscious ideas become subconscious. You see, that's the thing. When we really, really, really believe something, it's more than just conscious at that point. Then it sinks down into your subconscious. And so it becomes knee-jerk. Your belief system becomes automatic. Now, that's not necessarily a good thing, I've, as I've talked many times before about, because that creates a lot of problems in terms of ideology and dogma. If you're just basically subconsciously being driven, you don't know why you believe something except that it's very dogmatically driven into you or you've driven into yourself. Nonetheless, it seems to me that the way one shapes reality must be, for better or for worse, largely subconscious. Uh, and there's many, many, many manifestations. Let's talk about health and well-being. You know, mind over matter, um, overcoming illness, overcoming something even as, uh, as serious as cancer, overcoming other diseases. And many people believe, as do I, that mental focus, mental, you know, uh, positive thinking, um, helps. However, uh, most people would say it helps when it becomes a kind of a faith. So once again, when you say faith, it goes beyond just belief. Because you see, when you believe something, isn't it always a battle? Isn't it a battle? You believe something and yet you have doubts and it creeps in. Yes, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. In the back of your mind, a little voice is saying, well, well, I don't know. I don't know if I'm sure about that. But I, I believe, yeah, I believe it, I believe it. I believe it, you know. And there is a battle between the conscious and the subconscious mind. Now, tonight, when I, as the title suggests, hypnosis and the shaping of reality, I am using hypnosis as a kind of a code word for subconscious. I could have called it subconscious, the subconscious and the shaping of reality, just like I called the other one consciousness and, and the shaping of reality. Um, being a hypnotist, though, I'm using that word because it, it, it gives me the opportunity to talk about some other tangential um, topics uh, tonight. Uh, but the thing about the subconscious mind is when you subconsciously believe something and additionally believe something, then you have this transformational transference. Mind over matter, mind and body, they all become one. That's the point, ladies and gentlemen. The unification of mind and body needs a subconscious, or if you would, an unconscious component. Subconscious, unconscious, they're the same thing. I think the vernacular is unconscious is just even a, a, a several steps deeper than the subconscious. But that's, it's, it's, that's a matter of just um, semantics. Um, I'm going to call it subconscious tonight. Subconscious seems to be more subliminal. Unconscious sometimes means totally like the autonomic nervous system and more deeply repressed uh, memories. But let's talk. Let, I, I'll interchange subconscious and unconscious. I mostly use subconscious. And that is the thing. That's where we want to go when you believe that you can get well, when you believe that you can do the job, that you can be successful that you can be victorious, that you can overcome, that you can make the difference, that you can influence the people, do the things that you want to do, that you believe you can do, that you believe that you should do. Now, of course, it's not just that. It's just not just about that because you could be a madman and believe this, and that's not going to really do any good. It, you might create a lot of havoc, but you're not going to get what you, in, your, in your fantasies you're talking about. That's where we come full circle back to this 3 to 6%. Because what we're talking about here is not just un this unrealistic, you know, yeah, just focus your mind and make it become your subconscious belief, and presto, change-o, we have a new world. 
All your problems are gone. They disappear. Well, I'm not saying that will never be possible. Who knows? In the, in the distant future, what's going to happen? But in our day today, I mean, that's, that's just unrealistic. It's ridiculous. I mean, uh, I, I mean, it is always people do amazing things, but generally speaking, you just can't snap your fingers and believe and everything happens. In, 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 in the real world, what we're talking about is an edge, a little edge to, to push forward a bit, to push the envelope, to make the little difference that tips the balance. And so that's why, for example, diet is important. A supplement, nutritional supplementation is important. Exercise is important. Meditation is important. So med- meditation, you know, crosses over into the physical and the mental. But still, a life that is harmonic and balance, in balance, balance of in mind, in body, and spirit. That seems like the total mind body approach. And so with hypnosis, for example, that's what we try to do. We try to create harmony between the conscious and the subconscious mind. Um, so this is the seat. I'm going to just make a few points here. Um, before moving to a break. We're still a little bit from that. Um, So, for example, creativity. Where does that come from? Right now, I mean, I've talked many times about my new group I founded, the Creativity Expo, which you can visit at creativityexpo.org. And... I'm looking to build a community of of creative workers, creative thinkers, creative artists, creative filmmakers, creative authors, of course. Uh, And where does creativity come from? If you just live in your conscious realm, in my humble opinion, you're not likely to be particularly creative. Now, you could be. You could be. Uh, you, you could be creative because, you know, you can have wordplay and you can bounce ideas around and one thing leads to another and you get creative juxtapositions and you can be a creative person that way. Um, but the type of creativity I'm talking about, which is I truly think is, a, is the heart of creativity, is that it ultimately transcends language, that you have suddenly a flash of insight and you, it seems like you don't even know where it came from. And that's, to me, what I'm talking about. And that's where uh, uh, hypnosis and other, cre- uh, other techniques that reach into the subconscious mind to allow a new insight to become knowable by the conscious mind that is the seat of creativity. And I'm going to talk about a lot of different things tonight um, that I've been involved with lately or not so much uh, or, or, or ongoing, but more so now. And uh, how it point, makes a point about the, crea- about the subconscious mind and creativity and why it is so important at the same time um, it can be very, very uh, dangerous uh, as well. Very dangerous. Um, you know, it's wordplay. Here's another thing, uh, the idea of dialectic. Well, in t- let's the traditional sense. Let's look at the Hegelian dialectic. I have my own ideas in dialectic, but um, I'm not, I don't think I'll be just discussing that tonight. But I'm thinking about Hegelian dialectic and also Platonic, you know, Socratic dialogue, Plato's dialectic where you have these two opposite ideas and in he- in the Hegelian sense those two that opposition um, creates a synthesis in other words a new solution that's the b- child you might say of the synthesis and the antithesis uh, in um, 
you know, in Socratic, uh, you know, in, in Plato's dialectic or the Socratic dialogue, um, uh, the Socratic method, uh, you have uh, two uh, opposing ideas, and then from that opposing idea, you 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 sort of uh, come in, you 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 get a solution from the contest text between the two. It's very similar, actually. Uh, to Hegel, when you, it doesn't seem that way when you're reading it, but it actually is. And, and and what actually is happening, you're just playing with words, because you have concepts, and then from these concepts, um, you get other concepts. Now, that is an interesting way to get new ideas. That goes along, you know, to, with what I was just saying before about um, having words, and you're not delving into the subconscious too much. The thing about it is, is when you look at Hegelian dialectic, and if you dispense with his method and just see the flow of nature through opposing forces, then you do truly get a glimpse of a, a creative force, because you're not limiting yourself to words or concepts, but to actually phenomena, or perceived reality, or perceived behavior not limiting yourself to self-limiting words and concepts, but actually, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, let's call it reality. Uh, let's just call it the, ph- the, the phenomena of life that includes human behavior, includes human thought, includes um, all kinds of uh, things like that, or all kinds of conflict. And so there, it, 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 you're, you, with a di- a direct, you do have something that's interesting, I think, and, and useful. Um, so, getting back to what I'm talking about here, because I know I do tend to meander, but I, I think I'm making sense, because I'm trying to say that the, the, the subconscious, you know, obviously the sub, the underlining, the, the substratum, that is where true change generally comes from. And even, like I said, if it's purely conscious, eventually when it's purely conscious, it'll seep down into that level. However, the reverse is not true. If you have something subconscious, it does not necessarily rise above to the consciousness. As a matter of fact, um, that's what therapy is about, because that um, subconscious turmoil or belief system is not actually apparent to the person. And that happens, actually, you might say, the collective subconscious, or the collective unconscious, as Jung said, because uh, they, are, they are buried. And that's why it becomes such a mystification, a revelation, when someone points out, oh, that's the reason, because of this, because of that, because of this repression, because of this cultural tradition that has, has left, left vestiges behind it, even though it's long extinct but we still think that way. Or deeply ingrained thoughts, like ideology and and dogma, of course, which people don't realize uh, most of the time because that's controlling the way they think. We're all born into a constant culture, and we think a certain way to some degree, which is not bad or not, 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 not bad or good. It's only bad or good if you can reason to why it is bad or good, and then you would make... Um, a, a determination. And so uh, that, that, that's the field of ethics that I always come back to. And that's, that's uh, what I try to do in my book, Ethical Empowerment, Virtue Beyond the Paradigms. Um, I, I'm going to get more into this about hypnosis and about the subconscious mind and how that actually may be the thing that shapes reality may be the thing that actually the, is, is the human connection to things like, in quantum physics, um, the uh, double slit experiment, which we'll talk about. Well, that, we already did a little bit, but we'll talk about that in, in quantum physics. It's, it's a kind of a link, the quantum link, how... Uh, how influence really shapes reality. That's what I'm going to want. I want to continue on that thread when we get back. 
So, Scott, we'll take a break right now, and uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. This is Arthur D. Schwartz. You know, beliefs and disbeliefs can be very powerful. Much like philosophy, hypnotism is concerned with belief. Hypnotherapy, a practical application of hypnotism, may largely be described as the practice of removing false beliefs that form mental blocks to success, to happiness, and to well-being. In my hypnotherapy, and philosophical counseling practice, I combine my work in philosophy with hypnotism in order to clear mental blockages that can occur on both conscious and subconscious levels. A mental block may be conscious or subconscious and can be expressed, for example, in the form of anxiety, low self-esteem or low motivation, bad habits, tobacco habits, weight gain, low performance, and much more. If you are interested in using hypnosis and the power of the mind to overcome mental blocks and barriers that have emerged in your life, please feel free to give me a call at 617-964-4800 or visit www.integralhypnosis.com. That's I N T E G R A L Hypnosis dot com. This is Arthur D. Schwartz, host of Philosophic Perspectives on the Artist First Radio Network. Are you an author, filmmaker, inventor, creative artist, or thinker? Would you like to present and promote your work on my radio show? I will be hosting small round table discussions on many intellectually stimulating and inspiring topics. The discussions will be an opportunity for you to share and promote your work. If you are interested, here is all that you need to do. Join creativityexpo.org. It's totally free. Then, after you join, post basic information about yourself on the presenter's registry, which may be found by clicking the Discussions tab located on the menu bar at the top of the page. To summarize, if you are an author, filmmaker, inventor, or artist, and are interested in participating in discussion groups on the Philosophic Perspectives radio show, go now to creativityexpo.org and sign up with the group. That's C R E A T I V I T Y expo.org, creativityexpo.org. Click on the Discussions tab and post a little information about yourself and the work that you do. That's it, folks. It's really that easy. I will send you a confirmation message after I receive your posting. For more information, please email me at radio at arthurdschwartz.com. Philosophic Perspectives is broadcast live on the Artist First radio network on the first and third Wednesdays of each month, 10 p.m. Eastern and 7 p.m. Pacific Time. Find the link to the Philosophic Perspectives show page by visiting artistfirst.com. Thanks for being one of the way cool people and joining us on Philosophic Perspectives on the Artist First Radio Network. Let's get right back to it. Here's your host, Arthur D. Schwartz. Welcome back, everybody. Or should I say, welcome back, cool people. It's you, 
who make me cool. <laughs> okay, um, so we're talking about hypnosis and the shaping of reality. So here's where I want to, and I kind of just had this thought tonight when I was um, doing some, writing some notes down for this program. What I think, when I when I was just talking before the uh, break about uh, the, the, uh, the, the the subconscious, and that's really the link to the quantum world, you might say. Well, I put this is what I, this is what I, I I I think. So you you have a tension between the conscious and the subconscious. Of course, that's what hypnosis is about. Kind of brings the subconscious in harmony. You know, you have a bad habit. You know, you don't want to do it, but you you habitually, you know, subconsciously, habitually do you want something else. And so, until you harmonize the two spheres of the mind, um, you're going to have a problem. Uh, but here is the thing: when we come back to the idea of mental focus, remember we're talking about focus. Like when you focus on these experiments, these parapsychological experiments, where the random ge- number generator shows a three to six percent variation outside the realm of of chance if the observer or observers focus on a particular sequence or particular number. Now, if you're focusing on the conscious mind or the subconscious mind, when you're focusing on one or the other, there's going to be an effect there's going to be an important effect. Now, I think it's mostly, it's the subconscious. Because like I said, ultimately, a conscious idea that really is powerful will ultimately become subconscious. Now, that's not universally true. You can have an idea, act on it, and make a big, you know, do something on the impulse and... uh, well, impulse is subconscious. Actually, I'll take it back. If you do something impulsively, that's, that's the subconscious for you. So I'll stick with what I'm trying to say. I mean, I think ultimately it's the subconscious that is the more important factor because really significant conscious acts most generally have to do with the subconscious. Even Again, if you think about something terrible, or act of violence, something subconscious, well, that uh, uh, impulsive, well, that's subconscious. If you if you do something because you are indoctrinated or you believe very much and you get drummed in your head, you do something. Well, yes, that's your conscious belief, but also your subconscious belief. Clearly, it's a dogma. Um, if you work really, really hard because you want to see something successful and you and it's a good idea and you and you work and you work and you work and you work and you keep driving and then you succeed. Well, when you repeat, re- repetition is one of the easiest and most obvious. You know common, common, ordinary um, ways, mundane ways of, of dri- driving into your subconscious. I mean, that's the old-fashioned way of getting habits. Just continue your routine. Eventually, you get there. So all these things are subconscious. The thing is, I am here, I'm talking about two fundamental things. I am talking about in my, my, I should say my interest. It, it's it, around two important things here. One is dr- dramatic change for good, whether it's a society or an individual, or the threat of dramatic change for ill or bad. And the thing about that is, is we need to look at the impulse that's driving us. Now, um, that can be involved in bad or good. Well, if it's in good, we're okay. Bad, not so good. Now, how do you determine that? Well, of course, then you get back to ethics. I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to talk about my book today, but it's ethical empowerment, virtue beyond virtue beyond the paradigms. Um, the book goes into that's what the book is basically about: looking at the underpinnings of what actually makes morality morality, what makes ethics moral, you might say. Uh, and uh, it, it, it kind of, and, and, I, and, and I explain how it does become sort of subconscious, and we, have to need, we need to break through that uh, many times to get ethical clarity, you might say, mental clarity. But uh, 
The other thing is this. How do you get good ideas that you don't yet have? And how do you counter and go against the bad ideas, the troubling ideas, the self-destructive ideas? Right? Those, I would say, are the two biggest factors for good how to be creative, how to cross over to realms, to ideas, to, to, to uh, solutions, to conclusions, to insights that you never had before, that flash. For me, it's sometimes into taking a shower or walk, going for a walk, a flash. But collectively, for a society, you need that. So on a positive way, that's what we need. Everything, you know, I believe, needs to be guided by loving intention. I've said that many, many times. Other that, other, otherwise, you are destined to uh, uh, difficulties, ethical difficulties, and more than that. Because ultimately, if it's not ethical, it's a full, uh, ultimately going to be dysfunctional. But that's another subject. But I would say, ultimately, over time, if it's not ethical, it becomes dysfunctional. Now, how do you counter, how do you use the subconscious, if I can say hypnosis, so-called, I mean, in terms of a, a code word, meaning subconscious, to change what's going on that's bad, whether within yourself or within society? Well, that has to do with ideology and dogma, because ideology and dogma is nothing but the collective um, hypnotization of belief. And it doesn't mean it's, it's intrinsically bad. It doesn't have to be bad, but it almost always is in part because an ideology is incapable, really, of adapting with enough resiliency and flexibility to, you know, to, 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 to meet the needs of, of what needs to be done in a certain situation. Uh, so therefore, uh, I, I, I think all the, all ideologies are basically not a good thing because it's, it stultifies, it inhibits creative thinking in terms of going beyond the boundaries, going beyond the paradigms. So those are the things that tip the balance. When you can, when you can focus on your subconscious mind and you can marry that to a conscious deliberation of deep, re, deep uh, ethical reflection based on uh, loving intention, with respecting, cons- respecting the views of others, trying to achieve some kind of a consensus openly with an open mind, with, uh, undogmatically, accepting fault and, and making mistakes as part of the process, but being open to correction. That is the grounding and the basis of a true flourishing in the society, the world, and in an individuals that we all want to see. So when I talk about hypnosis and shaping reality, I'm talking about techniques, not just hypnosis, but other techniques as well, that allow us to transcend the knots in our head connect with the true, most beautiful subconscious force there is, which is love, and then open the gates to all things good that can become possible. And this, of course, is in harmony with all the great religions, with Christianity, with Judaism, with Islam, with Buddhism, with Hinduism. They all say that. The problem is with religion, just like politics and just like anything else, philosophy, when it becomes too dogmatic and too ideological, they all just become uh, basically wooden pegs that um, really don't do the job. It doesn't have to be that way, but far too often it is. Now, since I'm on this, actually, you know what? I'm looking at the clock, 
and I think uh, Scott gave me some a little extra time, but I'm looking at it. Okay, I'm, no, I'm going to I'm looking at it now. I'm going to talk. I'll talk another maybe a few minutes, and then we'll have a break and we'll come back. But here are some things that I want to now uh, navigate the discussion into mysticism, past life regressions, which I work with in my practice. Uh, which I'll talk about, and I'm actually becoming more involved with that. I'm having some ama- amazing things happening, I think, uh, with that. Um, of course, I've already mentioned uh, the ethical moral center. And then again, of course, I can't do a show, or it seems like I can, without mentioning the current um, thing with the spectacle in Washington, D.C. And by the way, um, I did have the opportunity to listen to Scott at the end of the conversation of last night's show on uh, Project Urantia, and I was uh, very pleased to hear him say that, you know, uh, he was, uh, you know, sounding like he was upset, like all of us, uh, most, well, many of us, um, with what's going on with Trump, uh, Donald Trump. But he said, but you know, some things he said something, and, and he talked about, you know, he told the big farmer to, you know, uh, bring down the prices. And Scott, I agree with you 100. percent so that, that, that the point I'm trying to make there is um, when you're non-dogmatic, you're able to uphold somebody who might be your opponent. That's what an open mind is. No one is 100% right, and no one who is bad um, is immune from saying some, doing something that's good. I mean, the most heinous uh, regimes in the world have done some good things. That doesn't justify the regime. <laughs> It just means that they did something good. You know, Mussolini got the trains running on time, as they say. Um, so I don't know how he, how he did that, but it's certainly good that he got the trains running on time. Uh, that doesn't make him any less of a monster. Same thing with his Hitler. I, I think the Nazis were to, I supposedly ahead of the game in terms of um, environmentalism, actually. Arthur, so. uh, if, if I could just... I know how yeah. Mussolini got the trains to run on time. How do you do it? He shot the engineers that didn't run on time. <laughs> well, see, <laughs> I don't, <laughs> thank you for pointing that out. Well, I certainly don't justify that. I'm just making a point of getting the run, trains running on time in and of itself is not a bad thing. If he shoots the engineers, not so good. <laughs> I, I totally agree. And I shouldn't even be laughing. I mean, when we think about these, these monsters in history, um, you know, it's not a laughing matter. And you know what? Uh, that's the thing I have to fear about Donald Trump. Right now, he's just... He just uh, the problem with him is he, he's, he's doing everything he said he would do. And so, to me, um, in many respects, that's a frightening idea. Because he said a lot of things about stifling the press and other things. Well, anyway, now I will take that break, and we'll be back shortly. In Ethical Empowerment, Virtue Beyond the Paradigms, Arthur D. Schwartz presents an ethical theory that is a framework for evaluating moral conundrums that go beyond legalistic rulemaking, dogmatism, and preconditioned thinking. The book is as much an ethical framework for unconventional ideas as it is for staying with convention. Ethical Empowerment is a manifesto of non-doctrinaire perspective. Ultimately, the hypnotic thinking of ideology and dogmatism can only be overcome by returning to the true source and essence of morality, which is nothing less than universal love. Discover how the philosophically liberating approach of the ethical empowerment can be applied to the range of ethical, social, and political controversy. 
read about a plan to eliminate all political parties, entertain the possibility of an overhaul of the patent system and its replacement with a system that rewards inventors while eliminating monopolistic control of patents and technological suppression. Many other transformative ideas are discussed in the book, including issues related to the monetary system, real estate, scientific paradigms, and a rational approach to conspiracy theory. While ethical empowerment will challenge your mind to consider new perspectives, the ethical challenge is always to keep the diversity, depth, and breadth of perspective within the boundaries of love. Ethical Empowerment is available at Amazon.com and most online booksellers in both print and ebook editions. You are listening to Philosophic Perspectives on the Artist First Radio Network. Back to your host, Mr. Arthur D. Schwartz. Hello again. Well, we're going into the home stretch now. This is the final segment tonight. And uh, so once again, the topic of tonight's discussion is hypnosis and the shaping of reality. It's a kind of counter or, or a bookend to the show I did last month on the 4th of January called Consciousness and the Shaping of Reality. And, uh, of course, uh, the subconscious, you know, the hypnosis I'm using as a kind of a code word for subconsciousness. Um, and I, but I'm, I'm actually coming down, you know, out today in terms of saying, well, uh, hypnosis, uh, it's the subconscious is probably the more key factor um, to, uh, in terms of shaping reality. Because even... Uh, because conscious belief is really powerful, is going to ultimately become subconscious. It's not necessarily the other way around. Because the subconscious can remain locked, and it won't come, and it, 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 it's, it's just be causing mischief, but it, it's, not, it's, it's out of control. It, it's actually making people do, not do things they want to do. So, uh, so subconscious, uh, the subconscious mind, I think, is the key when we look and as I try to explain in, in, in connection with um, parapsychology, in connection with uh, work in quantum physics, um, in terms of um, this observer approach um, that is influential, and so I'm coming down there. And by the way, I mentioned the double slip you know, experiment. That's where, very quickly, and I, I don't fully understand it, but you have a, in a laboratory, they have, you have a, uh, 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 photons, you have a light beam and you have photons coming from two different points and um, or you have a photon just being shot, I'm not sure, you, you, they go through a two slits and if it's observed, not by just a person, but even by a camera any kind of, ob it could be mechanical observation they, 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 the focus collapses so that the uh, photon would be not in two places, uh, but in one. Whereas otherwise, um, it, it's a wave, and so it doesn't collapse. Anyway, I'm no physicist, obviously, um, but in, in, in a very rudimentary way, um, that's, um, I shot to read up on that concept uh, again. But... Uh, when you talk about this type of thinking, I think it's the subconscious which is mostly influenced by this approach. Um, now, there's other things uh, that I want to uh, talk about here right now. I think my, I just had a thought that I think it just eluded me, but that's beside the point. Something quantum going on. <laughs> um, so recently I've been doing uh, a lot of past life regression in my hypnotherapy practice. It's one of the things I do. And I can tell you that some amazing things have been happening and how my clients are getting tremendous insights by experiencing uh, a past life that explains um, what is in some way, gnawing at them, 
troubling them or questioning. And then you have this, it's a very vivid regression, um, and it all becomes clear. And in one case, actually, it was, it, she went online and verified the information with pictures and, and all that. I'm not going to specifics because I don't want to uh, compromise any kind of confidentiality, but um, I will just say that it was verified in terms of pictures of the individuals who she experienced, uh, saw in, in the regression and even the name and the year and the time and the buildings and all that. Now, the reason I mention this is uh, with past life regression, we have, you know, of course, with uh, reincarnation, many of you might be familiar with the notion of karma. Karma is the law of cause and effect. And karma really is its not just between lives. It's, it's going on right now. It's going on between me and you and every and everyone who's having an interaction. That's, that's karma. But... Um, it's more often thought about what happens between lives, if you believe in reincarnation. Not everybody does. I just become a believer. Of, I'm not sure how dogmatic, I, you know, of course me, I'm not dogmatic, but I think there's something seriously true about it. I also think there's something ser seriously true about the afterlife, too. So, I mean, I, there's, there's many ways to look at this. Um, because when you influence reality, what do you influence? When it comes to past life regression, you are influencing reality by coming into contact, it is believed, if you believe in this kind of thing. You're coming into contact of a life energy of soul material, of consciousness that extends through the eons. And you see, now you're talking about something that's completely immaterial, it would seem, that we can influence through hypnosis and past life regression. Now, once again, it doesn't have to be hypnosis. Um, I've had many clients come in and say they, they went to an, uh, a, 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 an, um, oh, excuse me, a psychic. And they, then the psychics have given them profound readings. I mean, I'm a skeptic when it comes to psychics of that sort, but I, I'm open to anything because more than once, I mean, several times, I get the same story. I get someone uh, came over and she went to see a psychic and she has this profound um, insight that uh, the psychic uh, told her, and that's why she came to see me to explore uh, in this way as well. So... Here, talking about shaping reality, you don't think that shapes reality? If, let's just say it's true. Let's say you come in touch with a form of life. You don't think that's shaping reality, making changes in a way that is incredibly powerful? Um, the, the, probably the most, uh, well, uh, in our con contemporary age, the most famous past life regressionist is... Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Wise, uh, Many Masters, Many Lives. Uh, what's his um, What's his first name? I, I don't know. I'm just forgetting that. I'm looking at the book. I'm trying to see on my bookshelf. Um, anyway, it'll come, it'll come to me in a second. And uh, he, uh, you know, with a psych he is a psychiatrist. And he, uh, here we go. Let's, let's, let's want to make sure. Here we go. Oh, yeah, Brian Weiss. Yeah, Brian Weiss. Many masters, many lives. And uh, he just, he didn't know anything about his past life regression. And he was regressing a, a patient. And before you know, she's, you know, for um, anxiety, you know, in her earlier in her life, before she knows that she's a French peasant. And uh, in, in about the 16th century, I think, or maybe 17th century. And it was later supposedly verified 
by old records. Uh, they they or sent they went or they hired somebody to go to the village, this old village in France, and you know they in Europe they have all these old records and they verified the name and the whole the existence of this particular person. So this is a this is certainly a way of influencing reality. Let's just say past life regression some day becomes more prevalent and we master the, the art of it, or shall I say the science of it is such a thing, and it becomes accepted, and it becomes validated because of rigorous scientific investigation, checking records and so forth. And, and believe me, there are tremendous amounts of credible research by extremely renowned scientists that verifies this. I always forget the most the name of the most famous one. I, he's at, uh, I think, the Duke or University of North Carolina. And I perpetually uh, forget his name, and he's, but he worked with children, and anyone who knows about the subject um, would know who I'm talking about. Um, any case, uh, so they, so, so if that should happen uh, in the future, if that should happen, uh, can you see how incredible that could be in terms of shaping reality, in terms of actually uh, accepting, actually accepting that this is a reality and this is this happens and our whole perspective on life would change. So let me, I'll just end it at that point. Oh, yeah, Ian uh, Stevenson. Here we go. Yeah, Ian Stevenson is a very, very well-known uh, researcher who's uh, passed on now. I'm looking him up right now. Just uh, Let's see. Ian Stevenson, yeah. Uh, he died in 2007. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, so, anyway, that's, um, yeah, that's... Um, yeah, he just died in 2007. Ian Stevenson. He had, he had enormous uh, research on children. And children are uh, often very, very... Uh, I mean, they, they don't... They, they, these memories of past lives are, are not, are not uh, buried like they do, like they are when we get older. And it's just uh, his, his work is amazing, voluminous. Um, Okay, well, I'm going to wrap up with what's become a favorite topic with a lot of you, is of course, um, <clears throat> President Trump. It does hurt me to say that. So, you know, let's talk about it from the point of view of the conscious and the subconscious. And I just, I just can't get over the campaign. You know, for me, like I just said before the break, I mean, I can agree with some of the things. I mean, if he wants to bring down the cost of uh, the pharmaceuticals, I certainly uh, agree with that. If he's going to curtail big pharma, um, I certainly agree with that. Uh, so, but, I mean, I disagree with a lot of his policies as well. I disagree with his immigration policy, certainly. His health policy, certainly. But nonetheless, that's not the, the, the biggest problem for me. The problem was his campaign, his demagoguery, his, his habitual, it seems like, um, uh, his, 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 his lying, his, his congenital lying, it seems like. His bully, his bullying, yes. his racist statements. And so, uh, and mostly the demagoguery. I mean, I've talked about that. I mean, I just think that's extremely troubling. That poison, whatever success he might have, it's poisoned by this because he's poisoned um, a whole generation of people who are kids now, and they're going to expect uh, their candidate to act like Donald Trump. It's, it's a scary thought. And I don't think there's anything he can do as president that would make up for the, that 
destructiveness it has to our political system. This is my point of view. But I think the process in a democracy is the most important thing, more than the policies. And that's why it's extremely regretful what happened during this campaign. However, what I observe is with Trump, I don't know. I still don't know if what he says he really believes. Because he's held, he's held a very different opinion only very, very recently. Virtually every policy stand he has, he was the opposite within the past 10 years. Something happened that he got he swayed way to the right. He was normally considered to be a moderate Republican. I think he, I think people tell me he used to be a Democrat. I don't remember that. I never watched his program, so my memories of him morally uh, uh, more go back to when he was younger, before he had that program. And I remember him as a you know a colorful character, but I didn't know much about him and. Uh, you know, I, I didn't have much of an opinion, but probably maybe slightly positive, but not really strong one way or the other, until this campaign happened, and I couldn't believe what I was watching. I just could not believe it. And it seems to me there has been a big change, although someone told me who grew up in New York said, no, that's, that was, that's always been Donald Trump. He did have that uh, discrimination suit um, very early in his uh, business career. So, so probably there. But the thing is, uh, he, his, his policy positions have changed. And so here's the thing. Is it conscious or subconscious? In the case of Donald Trump, I have to raise the issue. Is he really weak on the subconscious part? Is it all against, like, clouds of belief that he's, he's acquired recently? He talks to somebody. He gets an idea. And that's what it is, and not too much underneath, you know, just not too much of a there there. Should I say empty suit? I've read that when, when you know, when he was, uh, you know, before he ran for this, uh, before this business campaign, uh, examples of when he were in business meetings, um, his counselors always made sure they were the last one to leave. Because the last person they spoke to is usually the one that influenced him to do what he ends up doing. And I believe it simply by, by observing how now he's surrounded himself by this Breitbart group. And uh, he's, he's even uh, appointed uh, Stephen. Uh, are you there, Scott? What's his name? Stephen, uh, his, you know, the advisor for Breitbart? Uh, um, Bannon. Yeah, Stephen Steve Bannon. Bannon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he 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 did not appoint generals to the highest security um, panel uh, in the government. Uh, what's what, whatever it's called, the, the highest uh, national security um, panel. And he has Bannon, who has a record of white supremacist and, frankly, anti-Semitic, you know, uh, statements. Or in Breitbart, he was the editor. And so that was all going on in his newspaper. And, like, he goes on to the board, but the general, the chiefs of staff of the military aren't appointed. I mean, it makes absolutely no sense. And all, my only point is that he doesn't really seem to have a much of a reservoir of subconscious belief. Here's a guy that seems to me to be mostly, well, they talk about his puffery, which is a legal term. You know, that's kind of part of his demagoguery. You, you exaggerate, exaggerate, and then he can't call on it because it's just kind of salesmanship, so you can't call him on it. That's why the puffery works. Called Puffer. So one of the things I learned during a campaign where I studied demagoguery. But he's a guy that doesn't seem to have much of a subconscious. I mean, even his racist stuff or racial, okay, I won't say racist, racial statements. You, you just, I just have to wonder is this just purely 
he what he is is an opportunist. So whatever he, whatever he says, whatever he, he'll say what he needs to say to get to where he wants to get to, but actually the words don't really mean much. You see it, you saw it all the time during the campaign. I mean, with, you, you saw how he was lambasting Hillary and all that, and, and talking about a terrible Secretary of State, a terrible this and a terrible that. And of course, here's the thing. A, a couple of years before that, he's on, on camera saying, oh, well, he, they're wonderful people, both Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton was the best Secretary of State. Best, probably, than probably anyone who ever was Secretary of State. You can go online and check it. She was already Secretary of State, so it wasn't that long ago. Right? It couldn't have been more than uh, five years ago. He said this. And now he has a campaign, and he's just talking about the, the most vile way, and it just, it just uh, dismissing her and wanting to arrest her and, and just uh, being a terrible Secretary of State. And now, of course, he won. And during uh, the inauguration ceremony at the dinner, um, he was so happy that the Clintons came, and he says he really likes them, and he's so honored to have them. I mean, the guy, he just don't know what he, it, whatever he says, does he really believe? Or maybe it's just that maybe he doesn't believe much of anything, except he believes in Donald Trump. That's my concern a guy that really doesn't have much of a subconscious, a guy that only does what is expedient. And I would suggest that's not a good quality for a president of the United States. So I am greatly, uh, I'm happy, I'm pleased to see all this protest going on because it's a good thing for democracy. As a matter of fact, the reaction is so strong, it's very possible that um, the Trump presidency will create, a, could, could be a very, very good thing because of a dialectical reaction that now has raised the, the importance of paying attention to uh, political campaigns, particularly the presidential campaign. Um, and all those who didn't vote, many people didn't vote. At least 50% or more, I think, didn't vote. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, the, 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 w- this dialectical reaction will, in the long run, even though it might be difficult in the short term, in the long run, make us a better country because of the reaction that takes place. Personally, I'm not sure if Trump will even, I mean, you know, the idea of impeachment, I think, is extremely possible because of these foreign investments and the emollient, emollient, I forget how you pronounce that word, constitutional term, emollient or emollient uh, clause. Uh, see, I'm, I'm admitting I don't know how to pronounce it, so it's emollient, I think. Okay, enough about that. Um, one of these days, I will go, get through an entire broadcast without mentioning Donald Trump. So uh, I want to mention one thing. Oh, before I close, I just want to tell folks uh, creativity.org. Uh, visit the creati- excuse me, creativityexpo.org. Um, you can also find that um, at the, on uh, on Twitter now. Follow me on Twitter on that page. I have several pages now. Uh, I'm on uh, Creativity Expo uh, on the Facebook. You might find it. Uh, and please find it and like me. Uh, I need a few more likes to be able to get a, um, a, a, uh, a you know, a, uh, what's the word, uh, a name, uh, a specific name with a lot of, without all the numbers at the end. And so uh, if you find it, just like it. And so can help me do that. Uh, socialphilosophizers.com. Uh, I also now I have uh, Facebook and uh, Twitter. I have both uh, Creativity Expo and socialphilosophizers.com I have on Facebook and Twitter. And so if you can find those, follow and like. I appreciate that. Okay, so this closes out tonight's broadcast. 
Um, thanks again, Scott, for all your wonderful help. For links to my book, Ethical Empowerment, My Philosophical Counseling and Hypnotherapy Practice, and the Social Philosophizers Club, please visit arthurdschwartz.com. And this is Arthur D. Schwartz reminding you to live well and think deeply. Until next time, good night, everybody.